As Japan's defeat in World War II became increasingly clear, and given the shifting tide of the war slipping beyond Japanese influence before the invading forces, Japanese Air Force leaders were forced to consider unconventional tactics as a last-ditch attempt during the war. One such horrifying strategy, born from desperation, was the use of suicide attacks by pilots crashing their planes carrying explosives directly into enemy warships. This tactic, known as kamikaze meaning divine wind, was a last-ditch attempt to inflict significant damage on the Allied fleet and potentially alter the course of the war. The name, kamikaze, held a powerful historical significance for the Japanese. It referenced a 16th-century event, where a massive typhoon miraculously struck and scattered a Mongol invasion fleet threatening Japan. This event was interpreted as a divine intervention, a kamikaze sent by the gods to protect the country. By invoking this historical reference, the Japanese leadership aimed to inspire patriotism and a sense of destiny in the pilots chosen for these suicide missions. The first organized kamikaze attacks unfolded in the Battle of Samar, on October 25, 1944, with attacks focusing on U.S. Navy escort aircraft carriers. The kamikaze attacks were one-way missions. Most kamikaze planes were ordinary fighters or light bombers, were loaded with bombs and additional fuel tanks before being flown deliberately to crash into their targets. Once the pilot was locked into the aircraft, the pilot had no means of getting out once the missile was fastened to the aircraft that would launch it. Pilots would take off before dawn planning to crash into enemy carriers. Their objective wasn't to return, but to deliberately crash their planes into enemy ships. The U.S. Navy did not realize that the kamikazes were the beginning of a distinctly unpleasant tactic. The tactic was a chilling surprise for the unprepared U.S. Navy. By October 26, 55 kamikazes from the Special Attack Force had damaged large American escort carriers and smaller vessels. In total, seven carriers were hit, as well as 40 other ships. These attacks, while inflicting significant damage on Allied forces, ultimately proved a futile strategy in the face of overwhelming Allied power. The early success, such as the sinking of large escort carriers prompted an immediate expansion of the program. Over the next few months more than 2,000 aircrafts made such attacks. It was said by the Japanese forces that there were many volunteers for the suicidal forces. When the volunteers arrived for duty, there were twice as many people as available aircraft. Pilots were given a manual that detailed how they were supposed to think prepare and attack. From this manual, pilots were told to attain a high level of training to keep their health in the very best condition. These instructions, among others, were meant to make pilots mentally ready to die. Many of the kamikaze pilots believed their death would show the love they had for their country and a desire to fulfill their duty. While Japanese propaganda portrayed the pilots as eager volunteers, a different story emerged from their personal letters. An evidence-based study of 2,000 pilots' letters revealed that the pilots expressed complex emotions in private. These young men weren't just soldiers, they were sons, husbands, and friends. In those letters? They declared their determination to die to protect the homeland and expressed gratitude towards their school teachers, parents, and friends for their selfless support. Some young fathers left loving letters for their young wives and children to live well, while others expressed memories of love or sorrow of dying young. Few shared memories of unfulfilled love or the anguish of leaving their families behind. These young men weren't just pilots, they were becoming martyrs, sacrificing themselves. The pilot's manual also instructed the pilots to never close their eyes, as this would lower the chances of hitting their targets. In the final moments before the crash, the pilot was to yell hisatsu at the top of his lungs, which translates to certain kill. Before the formation of kamikaze units, pilots had made deliberate crashes as a last resort, when their aircraft had suffered severe damage or wanted to do as much damage to the enemy as possible, since they were crashing anyway. The training of new pilots took a lot of time and fuel neither of which the Japanese had in abundance. A kamikaze pilot did not need in-death training that a fighter pilot required. He only needed to be able to take off, fly a distance, and crash into an enemy ship. The kamikaze idea had by now spread far and wide among the Japanese military. Soon kamikaze corps were being established in Japan itself and was expanded to other suicidal methods of defeating the enemy. One of such methods was known as the Katen, a manned suicide torpedo that was intended to sneak into American-held harbors and sink enemy ships. Then came the Oka, a human-piloted bomb released from an aircraft over the target and flown into that target by the pilot. There were also suicide explosive speedboats Shinyo or Sea Quake, a small plywood craft filled with explosives, driven by a crew of one or two into enemy ships as they approached the shore of a Japanese base. One of the negative byproducts of rushing pilots through training program to qualify them as kamikazes was that, they had poor ship identification skills. 
their ability to accurately identify enemy ships was compromised. As a result, they were more prone to misidentifying friendly vessels as enemy targets, leading to tragic consequences. Mistaken attacks on these support vessels not only resulted in the loss of vital logistical support for the main fleet but also posed significant risks to the lives of sailors on board which had repercussions for the effectiveness and safety of ships. Following the implementation of the kamikaze tactic, newspapers and various forms of media played a significant role in promoting and supporting this strategy. Advertisements, articles, and stories were widely circulated to encourage recruitment and rally public backing for the kamikaze pilots. These media portrayals depicted the pilots as courageous heroes sacrificing themselves for their country's cause. In October 1944, the Nippon Times, a prominent newspaper at the time, featured an article quoting every Japanese has the potential to join the Special Attack Corps. The ethos of the Special Attack Corps, highlighting it as a manifestation of the deep-rooted spirit present within every Japanese individual. These words conveyed the belief that every Japanese person possessed the potential to join the ranks of the Special Attack Corps underscoring the collective commitment to the cause. Before embarking on their final missions, kamikaze pilots participated in ceremonial rituals. As part of these rituals, the kamikaze pilots would share ceremonial cups of sake or water, known as mizu no sakazuki. While army officers often carried their swords, navy pilots typically did not. However, all kamikaze pilots, like other Japanese aviators flying over hostile territory, were equipped with a Nambu pistol, either issued or purchased to use as a means of ending their lives if capture seemed imminent. In addition to these preparations, kamikaze pilots adhered to several customary practices. They wore senenbari, a belt of a thousand stitches, traditionally bestowed upon them by their mothers, symbolizing protection and luck. Before departure, they composed and recited death poems, a tradition inherited from the samurai who did so before committing seppuku. They carried prayers from their families and were presented with military decorations underscoring the gravity and honor associated with their mission. While it's often assumed that volunteers eagerly stepped forward for kamikaze missions, historical evidence suggests a more nuanced reality. There was significant coercion and peer pressure involved in recruiting soldiers for these sacrificial missions. The motivations of those who volunteered were multifaceted, extending beyond mere patriotism or bringing honor to their families. First-hand accounts from surviving kamikaze and escort pilots reveal a deep-seated desire to protect their families from perceived atrocities and potential extinction at the hands of the Allies. They viewed themselves as the last line of defense, driven by a profound sense of duty and obligation to safeguard their loved ones. The kamikaze pilots who returned from their missions were divided into two distinct categories, each facing different treatment based on the circumstances surrounding their return. Firstly, there were those who came back due to factors beyond their control such as unfavorable weather conditions or mechanical malfunctions. These pilots were not subjected to punishment or social stigma. Recognizing the scarcity of well-trained kamikaze pilots and the uncontrollable nature of their return, the Japanese authorities accepted them back without repercussions. Instead, their last flight was rescheduled, allowing them another opportunity to fulfill their mission. However, despite this leniency, some pilots struggled with feelings of guilt, especially if they were the sole survivor in their squadron, grappling with the burden of being spared while their comrades perished. Conversely, pilots who returned without valid reasons faced a different fate. Although they were not immediately executed, they were met with disciplinary measures, ranging from physical to mental punishment. The severity of these measures was tempered by the necessity to maintain the pilots' readiness for future missions. Furthermore, there were pilots who encountered psychological barriers preventing them from carrying out their missions. Although they were not executed for their inability to complete the mission, they endured harsh treatment, including being labeled as cowards and subjected to mental and physical torture. Additionally, their families faced violence, serving as a deterrent for future failures. Placing these pilots in squadrons heightened the pressure on them to perform, ensuring constant scrutiny and accountability. Some pilots opted to eject from their planes at the last moment, driven by a sudden fear of death. However, many of these pilots still perished, as their survival was often unlikely in the chaos of battle. According to the United States Strategic Bombing Survey, over 2,500 kamikaze missions were attempted. These suicide bombers, called kamikazes, sacrificed themselves to help Japan against the invading Americans. Despite causing damage to U.S. ships, these efforts ultimately failed to alter the course of the war. Japan's eventual surrendered after the United States detonated two atomic bombs over the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki.